Harvard Divinity School. The Writing of Wisdom, Divine Sophia in Russia, March 10th, 2022. Hello and welcome. My name is Hadi Fakuri, and I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. Welcome to today's event, the fifth in a new series on the divine feminine and its discontents. This series is part of a wider initiative the Center has launched on transcendence and transformation. If you're interested in learning more about the initiative, please visit our website and sign up for our weekly, weekly newsletter. Our last event featured Professor Anne Klein, who gave a talk on Yeshe Tsogyal, the leading feminine presence of, divine, of Tibetan Buddhism. The video of that event is now available on our website. Last semester, as some of you will recall, Professor Sean McGraw gave a talk exploring the figure of Sophia, or divine wisdom, in the works of two German thinkers, the 16th century mystic Jakob Böhme and the 19th century philosopher Friedrich Schelling, one of the leading figures of post-Kantian idealism. Today's presentation resumes with a the theme of Professor McGraw's lecture by following the fortune of Sophia in the Eastern Christian world, specifically Russian Orthodoxy, from ancient icons of divine wisdom to the work of the 19th century religious philosopher and poet, Vladimir Sergeyevich Solovyov, as well as his 20th century heirs. If Jakob Böhme, as Hegel had it, is the first German philosopher, Vladimir Solovyov can be described as Russia's first systematic philosopher. Solovyov had a far-reaching influence on Russian literature, theology, and philosophy, but also beyond the Russian-speaking world. In the spring, the center will be hosting a conference on a figure who, to some extent, might be considered Solovyov's spiritual heir, that is, the French theologian and scholar of Islamic mysticism, Henry Corbin. Our guest for today, Judith Deutsch Kornblatt, retired from a long career at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she was affiliated with the Department for Slavic Languages and Literature, the Religious Studies Program, the Program for Jewish Studies, and the Center for Russia, East Europe, and Eurasian Studies. She currently teaches part-time at the University of Tel Aviv. She has published extensively on subject as diverse as the Cossack in Russian literature and, so and Soviet Jewish baptism in the Russian Orthodox Church, as well as on Russian religious thought. She's the author of Divine Sophia, The Wisdom Writings of Vladimir Solovyov, published by Cornell University Press 2009, which I have here. Professor Kornblatt, Judith, I have already said this to you, but allow me to tell you again what a privilege it is for me to be able to host you today. Your work was and remains hugely important for my research and has become increasingly important for many of us here involved in the Transcendence and Transformation Project. In fact, the center is currently hosting a reading group devoted to Russian sophiology, and we have just finished reading your book, Divine Sophia, uh, Divine Sophia which remains one of the best introductions to Solovyov's thought. So we are happy that Professor Kornblatt accepted our invitation to speak to us about, about divine wisdom and Solovyov. Right now, I'd like to invite Judith to appear on screen. Hello. Hello there. Good to see you. <laughs> OK, uh, Judith, it's all yours. The floor is yours. Uh, you can share your screen. and. Uh, I'll reappear at the end of your presentation for discussion. Thank you very much once again. My pleasure. I want to thank you, Adi. I want to thank everybody at the uh, Center for the Study of World Religions for this opportunity. Um, and I hope for those of you who have just finished reading my book, I'm not going to be a little bit too repetitious, but we'll see. Before we start, I actually want to have a moment of silence for what's now happening in the area of the world where I had spent my career. Uh, where I'd, about which I'd spent my career studying, uh, both for those who are suffering in Ukraine, but also for those who are suffering from mis un, un, misinformation in uh, Russia, and for those um, journalists and other people in the media who are also suffering from their stances. So I'd just like to take one just small minute for one small half a minute for that.
All right. So I'm going to start out just with my title, The Writing of Wisdom, Divine Sophia in Russia, um, and explain something that those of you who are not Russian speakers or aware of Russian culture might not know. And that is in Russian, you don't only write a treatise or write a book, or write an article or write a story, you also write an icon, pisaks, ikonu. Um, and with that, I'm going to be looking at both verbal and visual expressions of the Divine Sophia, or Bajestinaya Primudrist, as it is called in Russian. For those of you who know me and know my work, it'll be no surprise that I'm going to center my talk on the religious philosopher, poet, playwright, short story writer, journalist, public intellectual, and eccentric, Vladimir Solovyov. To do so, I will introduce you to some of Solovyov's writings with an eye to the multiple influences on them in Byzantine and Russian iconography, as well as references to Christian and Hebrew scriptures, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, Kabbalah, and the works of the mystics that those of you who heard last fall's um, uh, presentation know about. And finally, I will be talking about his own private discussions with Sophia, who communicated with him through automatic writing. We'll be coming back to this slide later in my talk. Lest you scoff at Solovyov's foray into the more mystical sciences, remember that this Russian Orthodox religious philosopher lived at the height of fascination with the occult in late 19th century Europe as a whole. And although he announced that most, myst uh, most uh, mediums were charlatans or cranks, he did not abstain from frequenting seances on, uh, at least in at least three countries. So some of you have wrote about Sophia in poetry, humorous play and short story, as well as in possibly his all too serious philosophical texts. It is some of these genres that I will analyze to show the complexity of his intuition and his articulation of divine Sophia. In the last section of the presentation, I'm going to briefly explore Solovyov's legacy in Russian culture, including how his sophiology wrote the future of Russian theological discourse into Europe and into the 20th century as part of what has been called the Russian school that flourished in the second half of the 19th century and about the first third of the 20th. Uh, a, um, a school that uh, focused on a reframing of orthodox orthodoxy as a way of acknowledging the necessity of engagement with the world around us. And at this point, I want to uh, acknowledge my, my friend and mentor, uh, Paul Valier, uh, for all he taught me in this area. I know he's uh, one of the listeners now. At the end, I will just hint very briefly at what became of Sophia in the later 20th century, both what became of its serious theological side and its more wacky mystical streak. So that's the structure. Here's the thesis. Solovyov's attempts to write Sophia in his poetic and philosophical works were always buttressed by his personal experiences with her or him or it in its multiple forms. Ultimately for Solovyov, the divine Sophia was not a fourth hypostasis as some of his followers were accused of introducing into the Trinity. And despite the description of her appearance, she was not really a person, divine or otherwise, but an energy, an energy that unites into a whole, the multiplicity of reality. We'll be going over this quite a bit. Um, nor is she one member of, member of any binary, uh, such as Plato's Aphrodite Uranus and Aphrodite Mandamus. But again, she is an energy, a process, not a place or thing or person. Divine wisdom is and brings to us wholeness and multiplicity, all in one, what Solovyov called Sir Yedinstva. So I recognize now that not only might Solovyov be foreign to many here, but also that the entire culture and practice of Eastern Orthodoxy might be a bit outside the wheelhouse of many of you. So I will start with uh, a contemporary of Solovyov, a uh, figure perhaps closer to your center of comfort, William James. Um, Solovyov could not have read about visions and mystical experience in James 
influential varieties of religious experience for this was not published until two years after Solovyov's death. But the American philosopher, psychologist and spirit seeker was already well known to Solovyov in Solovyov's day for his writings. And uh, many of them were published in a journal for which Solovyov was one of the original founders. James called himself a piecemeal supernaturalist. He wrote, if one should make a division of all thinkers into naturalists and supernaturalists, I should undoubtedly have to go along with most philosophers into the supernaturalist branch. But there is a crasser and a more refined supernaturalism. And it is to the refined division that most philosophers at the present day belong. Refined supernaturalism, he says, is universalistic supernaturalism. For the crasser variety, piecemeal supernaturalism would perhaps be the better name. It admits miracles and providential leanings and finds no intellectual difficulty in mixing the ideal with the real worlds together by, together by interpolating influences from the ideal region among the forces that ca causally determine the real world's details. Had James known Solovyov, he would no doubt have included the Russian in his short list of contemporary piecemeal supernaturalists. The Russian visionary's multiple expressions of a figure he identified as Sophia live side by side with his own crass belly laugh, which was attested to many times. Solovyov's visions of Sophia, like James's attraction to manifestations of the spirit, remain fully grounded in the mundane, mundane world of reality. As we will see, I hope, Solovyov's various articulations of Sophia in written form make full use of all aspects of this material world, including the variety of verbal genres with which we articulate our thoughts, feelings, and beliefs. For Solovyov, the Sophia so, uh, so often evoked in the traditions he studied from Platonism to Gnosticism, from Philo to Kabbalah, from Dante to Goethe, she is the active bridge between the opposing worlds of matter and spirit, and she is more, the transfigurer of them both, the instigator and the model of new integrated organic whole. I'll begin with a poem by Solovyov published in 1875 when he was only 22 and two years before the 12 public lectures on God manhood or on divine humanity or on uh, that launched Solovyov's career as a public intellectual in which he articulated his theological take on Sophia. So here's the poem. My tsaritsa appeared to me today wrapped all in azure. My heart beat with a sweet delight and in the rays of approaching day, my soul shone with a quiet light while smoldering in the distance rose the fierce flame of earthly fire. I start with this early articulation to introduce you to some of the physical aspects of Solovyov Sophia here called by the Russian royal designation Tsaritsa, including her association with the color azure or sky blue, the rising sun, as well as her effect on the visionary. For he, like she, begins to shine like the light of the sky. That is, he is transfigured by her vision. And in this light, he experiences a sweet delight. And here's the beginning of another poem written at the same, but around the same time that adds the colors gold and silver the Gnostic roses and lilies in a green garden, a reflection with the sense of seeing and re-seeing and being seen and seeing oneself, and also a palace with seven pillars. And that's gonna be important pretty soon to us. My Tsaritsa has a lofty palace with seven golden pillars. My Tsaritsa has a seven pointed crown with countless precious stones. My Tsaritsa's green garden, in my Tsaritsa's green garden, Fair roses and lilies bloom, and a silvery stream catches the reflection of her curls and brow in its transparent waters. So had Solovyov had a vision of divine Sophia before he revised, as I say, the vision in his writings, according to him, yes. Although the only evidence we have of it, if you can call it evidence, is a rather self-mocking narrative poem written at almost the very end of his life, in which he describes three encounters, and that's the name of the poem, Three Encounters. He describes those three encounters with an unnamed female essence whom, 
is very similar to the Tsaritsa that we see here. The first vision, according to his revision in the, 19, in the 1898 poema, took place in church. Maybe this one, quite possibly this one, but I can't say for sure. This is the cathedral um, of the Dormition or the Assumption as it's in the Orthodox world, the uh, Uspensky Sabor. He had this vision, he claims in the poem, when he was nine, nine years old, and apparently feeling jealous of another boy for the attention that was paid to this other by his little girlfriend, Yulinka. And here's the poem, at least the part, this part of the poem about the, the vision. The altar's open, but where's the priest and the deacon? And where's the crowd that milled around in prayer? I'm gonna stop here for a second and, and tell all of you who've not been in a traditional Orthodox church that in general, there are no pews and people indeed milled around, bowed, um, lit candles, kissed icons and milled around some more. Where is this crowd? He continues, my flood of passions and that is his, his puppy love for Yulinka as well as his anger at this other one who was other boy who was pouring in on his uh, friendship with the girl. So he writes, my flood of passions drained all of a sudden as azure fills my soul and fills the air. Transpierced throughout by rays of gold and azure, unearthly flowers clasped within your hands. You smiled before me full of radiant favor, then nodded as you left for other lands. So note again, the azure, the rays of golden sun, the flowers, and the effect on the viewer who is transpierced by the color of sun and sky and the air around him and inside him fills with, fills with azure. So let me perhaps set the scene a little bit more. And again, this is largely for those who haven't spent a lot of time in um, Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, although I'm sure you all know about the presence of iconostasis, like an icon stand in those churches, what you might not realize is like, unlike a, a Catholic or a Protestant church, the altar is generally not visible to the worshipers. The altar is behind this iconostasis. Um, the iconostasis itself, um, there are some smaller ones with only one door, but they often have three doors. Here's one that's open, right? Here's another one over here. And in the center where you can't see behind um, here is usually a, um, an icon of Jesus Christ. Um, so why you might ask, does this vision that he taught, that he writes of, occur specifically when a door of the iconostasis is open? That is a door is open and allowing the worshipers to see into the altar, to see into the Holy of Holies. Um, this is also a time, a dr very dramatic time in the church service um, when the priest or the deacon will enter or leave from the Holy of Holies and come to be with the um, worshipers or vice versa, will live, leave up. Uh, them and go behind, sometimes to pick up the Eucharistic elements, sometimes to pick up a copy of the New Testament for a reading that's gonna come. And the whole service is orchestrated as a, as a kind of dramatic event. So thinking about that, what's it like when the door of the iconostasis is open and the altar is visible, um, we're led to a crucial series of early, right? As young as nine and probably younger. So early decidedly orthodox imprints on the young Volodya Solovyov that we need to take a look at more closely. So some orthodox theologians have already made a brief allusion to this. Uh, so some orthodox theologians have been at pains to prove that Solovyov's Sophia is non-canonical unorthodox and even heretical. And the elaborated sophiology of Solovyov's heirs provoked the most extensive reproach. And I'll mention this again later. For them, Solovyov's visions of a beautiful woman with azure eyes and a golden aura have nothing in common with the New Testament references to the male Christ as wisdom. Is Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God uh, from 1 Corinthians. Instead, her 
say her detractors, her female allure makes her pagan, sometimes they say, or Catholic, sometimes they say, or God forbid, Jewish and Kabbalistic and decidedly uh, Western. As one emigre, um, emigre theologian wrote, Solovyov simply had no knowledge of Sophia of the church. He knew the Sophia of Burma and his followers, the Sophia of Valentinus and the Kabbalah, and this Sophia is heretical and uncanonical. So my purpose in this section of my presentation, you'll see on icons, is to show that Solovyov's sources for so Sophia were not all foreign, um, not by any means, and that Orthodox tradition in the form of popular local icons indeed could have been an important influence on Solovyov's visions. Here are some samples of Sophia icons. What we should know at the beginning is that the symbolism of Byzantine and Russian icons of the divine Sophia is far from standardized and decidedly ambiguous. She, he, or it actually never existed as a real being like the saints or disciples or Jesus and Mary who themselves are the subjects of most icons. Even the gender of uh, Sophia in these traditional icons is questionable as the personified figure of Sophia is sometimes associated with Christ and here obviously Christ, the wisdom of God, um, but sometimes with Mary or depicted as an andro androgynous angel, usually Gabriel. Multiple depictions of Christ sometimes appear on one icon and we will be coming back to this schemata in a, in a Bit. I just want you to take a look here at something you might not see. And that is the star that is behind Sophia here in the middle. It's also the same star that's behind Christ the Pentocrator up above. This is called the wisdom star. Um, and so in part because of it, um, Sophia is often associated with icons of the transfiguration. And here you see the star shining forth um, of the transfiguration, but also associated with icons of the um, Holy Trinity. Um, this is a very famous one. And that's because of the Eucharistic um, references in the wisdom icons. Um, and this obviously retains the, um, the Christ um, uh, reference. And here you see on this very popular icon that I'm gonna show you bigger in just a minute, you see the table here set for presumably the Eucharist. So it is true that the first Byzantine wisdom icons were clearly associated with the New Testament passages. And this is no doubt, as many of you know, the intention behind the naming of the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. And that is there that this ninth century mosaic labeled Christ Holy Wisdom is found in the narthex. However, the symbolic representation of Proverbs 9, 1 through 5 in the 14th century became extremely popular, especially in Russia. Um, and here we read, wisdom has built her house. She has set up her seven pillars. The verses were read, as I've said, as an announcement um, of the mystery of the Eucharist, thus retaining the Christological theme but wisdom, as we can see here, and this is the close up of it, is um, personified as female. And actually, note again the wisdom star between her, behind her, ed, her head. So, I'm going to focus the remainder of this detour on icons and another extremely popular Russian icon, often called the Sophia Angel or the Novgorod Sophia icon. Here is one version of it. We saw another version of it in the opening slide. Um, and this is the version that I'm going to look at right now. And so if it's okay with you, I'm gonna pause share. Uh, no, I don't have a button that says stop share. It just says new share. Hmm. Stop share. All right. Um, so hopefully you can see me. And um, what I'm gonna show you is actually this icon 
on a board, this Sofia Novgorod icon or icon of the Novgorodian um, form. And you'll see that she is here in the middle and she is flanked by the mother of God here. Whoops, the mother of God here and John the Baptist here. And this is a traditional actually uh, shaping of the deesis with usually Christ in the middle and you couldn't see the Christ door in the um, iconostasis I showed you before, but there was a, a traditional flanking of Christ in this spot here, flanked by the mother of God and by John the, the precursor as he's called in Russia. Um, she is surrounded by a, an aureole of rays and above her head, Christ the Pantocrator blesses the angel and above him rests the Lord of hosts on a throne of clouds. Sometimes it's different uh, seraphim and cherubim, different angels. Um, and the middle, usually a, an altar, um, again, with a, a symbol of Christ. So in this sense, all images of Christ come together, including the medallion on the mother of God's chest of the baby Jesus, uh, Christ Emmanuel. All right, um, I'll give you a little break from the screen, but you're gonna have to go back now. Hopefully. Um, and this is the schemata that we work, looked at before where you see all different manifestations of Christ here and here and here, and also obviously here. So we know indeed that Solovyov knew this icon. Um, an icon of, this, of Sophia of the Novgorodian type uh, could be found um, in the sanctuary of the main cathedral of the Dormition, which we looked at before. And here it is from the inside. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of where the Sophia icon is, um, but also uh, there was a fresco um, on the external wall of the same, um, of the same cathedral. And this was a cathedral that very likely his parents went to. And there are other examples of places where we know he did go. Um, so did an icon of divine wisdom um, revealed at a dramatic moment, such as the opening of the iconostasis doors, did it inspire the young boy to see an azure and gold Sophia? Um, and himself to become filled with her aura. So I would say, ask you who can say yes, but who can say no? So Lviv's second vision, according to this poem, apparently took place in the British Museum where the now young scholar had gone, he said, to study Indian Gnostic and medieval philosophy. And we know that he was seen in the library reading Kabbalistic texts. The poetic eye of the poem, the narrator, um, was very closely based on Solovyov. Um, and as I said before already, it's a humorous narrative poem. So this I invokes Sophia with the words, O oh, radiance divine. And we read, these words had just appeared within my heart when the room all fills with azure and with gold. Before my eyes she shines, but only partly, alone, alone, I see her face, alone. To the speaker, or the viewer or the visionary, uh, we read that the instant lasted long and sweet as bliss. So that again, we have the azure and the gold, the shining and the bliss or delight. The third vision, also self-mocking, allegedly took place shortly thereafter in the desert beyond Cairo, where Solovyov, um, inspired by his reading of Kabbalah, Burma, Swedenborg and others, where he had gone after London, and where, in fact, the uh, Saritza, the, the Sophia figure, had told him to get thee to Egypt. Uh, this vision took place in the early morning, after a night during which the frock coat, top hat, hat wearing poetic persona was accosted by Bedouins and, says in the poem, who mistook him for the devil and left him there to die. And we know that an incident like this actually did happen to Solovyov as he wrote to his mother the next day about it. But then 25 years, years later, it becomes transformed in this poem. 
There in the desert, Solovyov has his third vision. I fell asleep when I awoke unfazed. The scent of roses filled earth and heaven's sweep. And in the purple of the sky's resplendence, your brimming eyes o'erflowed with azure blaze. You looked about like the first radiance of creation's universal day of days. What is, what was, whatever will be, was there embraced in one motionless gaze. Below run blue the rivers and the sea and alpine snows and distant forest waves. What is, what was, whatever will be, was there, uh, uh, was there embraced in one motionless gaze. Below run blue the rivers and the sea and alpine snows and distant forest waves. I saw it all and all I saw was one, a single image of all female beauty, the immeasurable encompassing its sound. You stand alone before me and within me. That desert day I saw you in your fullness, so radiant one, you have deceived me not. The roses in my soul shall ever flourish, flourish from now, no matter where I'm tossed about. But then the sun's orb rose above the skyline. A moment, then the vision hid away. The glorious sounds of bells perpetual chiming, the desert silent as my soul prayed. So yet again, we find the radiance, the dawn, the female beauty, the roses from the Tsaritsa's garden, and perhaps most telling, the mystical reality of multiple unity, where I saw it all and all I saw was one. A unity that both surrounds and suffuses the eye, right? The eye of the poem, the talk, the speaker, where you stand alone before me and within me, and we remember from the first vision, as azure fills my soul and fills the air. So again, consider the Novgorod type Sophia icon, the rosy face, the azure, the gold, the radiance, and remember the goal of an icon, to enter into the viewer, to make the viewer, the worshiper shine. Uh, the, the similarity between the iconography of the Sophia icon and the imagery of Solovyov's wisdom text suggests very strongly that the experience of a worshiper on V, um, express very strong, excuse me, the experience of a worshiper on viewing an, an icon. And here it's as explained by the, uh, by Solovyov's heir, Pavel Florensky, that he remembers the prototype. And the visual experience awakes for the viewer, here Florensky is talking about icons in general, the visual experience awakes for the viewer the bright clarities of a spiritual vision and brings the thing seen into immediately felt experience. So this could be the, the description, this poem of a true experience, a true encounter, these two, three true encounters. So looking for other visual clues of Solovyov's revision of Sophia, I have just a couple more images in the section to show, the section on poetry. So here's the reading room of the British Museum in 1875. This picture was taken then, and that was the year where um, Solovyov went to the British Museum reading room to study uh, Kabbalah and other sources on Sophia. It's not hard to imagine a vision of light and radiance in such a room, for indeed electric lights came to the British Museum only four years later in 1879, so that the reading room was really closed to readers whenever the light was not coming through the windows in just this way. The dome was repainted several times over the following century, but the reopening of the reading room just in the year 2000 reveals what Solovyov himself would have seen. And this is from a brochure that's for sale, if you'd like it, at the, uh, at the um, shop oh, now of the, the British Library, where I read uh, that it's a magnificent interior has been carefully restored uh, including the repair of the paper mache interior of the dome and reinstatement of the azure blue cream and gold decorative scheme. And here it is looking up and we remember his line from the second vision, I see your face, I see your face alone with the azure eye in the middle. Such an esteemed reading room like the icon-filled church in Solovyov's memory, not to mention the endless gold sand and azure sky of the Sahara, would be an ideal space for an encounter with Sophia. Next section, moving on to prose. 
when traveling home from Egypt via Italy, Solovio wrote his parents that, I quote, I'll stay for a month in Sorrento, Italy, where in the quiet of solitude, I will finish writing a kind of work of mystical, theosophical, philosophical, theurgic, political content in a dialogic form. And continues later, as for my essay, I absolutely must publish it since it will be the basis of all of my future endeavors. And in fact, he aimed to publish it in English so that it would be even more widely available. And he wrote, I can do nothing without referring to it. Well, this work of mystical, theosophical, philosophical, theurgic, political content turned out to be much more, but also much less than an ordinary essay. And uh, he had apparently intended just to submit it for his uh, doctoral thesis at the university, but ultimately recognized that it might be a little bit too wacky for that. What is preserved in the manuscript includes several chapters of differing length and completeness, filled with notes to himself, snippets of merely decipherable automatic writing, Gnostic and other mystical terminology, and incorporating a substantial dialogue between a, a, a speaker called Sophie and a philosophe. The, the La Sophia was in, in French, written in French. So Sophia, given a voice for the first time here, instructs her interlocutor in the meaning of the, meaning of the universe. So Solovyov's choice of dialogic form does more than evoke Plato, although the religious philosopher poet clearly trumpeted this classical source and continued to study and write about Greek philosophy throughout his life. And in fact, his first published poem was in fact a translation of what he believed to be a poem by Plato. Here in the dialogue, by giving Sophie a voice, he also continues the process of personifying the abstract figure of wisdom. In his poetry, as we saw, she appears as a person, at once the subject of the poems, Tsaritsamaya, but also the immaterial power of inspiration, mysteriously entering the poet in the light of dawn and transfiguring him. So it is in Russian, Tihim Svetim Dushaza Svetilis. He first apparently, Solovyov first apparently intended to call the entire hybrid prose work by this personal name, Sophie. But we see now in the manuscript, he crossed out that title above the monologic, more philosophical, or maybe we should say theosophical chapters and reserved Sophie only for the dialogues. Despite so Sophie's personal voice, which is often sarcastic, by the way, it's in the dialogues and through the dialogic form that Solovyov presents the clearest explanation of how divine wisdom can paradoxically partake of both divine and human worlds. In a discussion of why we can know the essence of things or being in itself, Sophie unites the seemingly contradictory philosophical schools of idealism and empiricism telling the philosopher that he should neither radically separate nor carelessly confuse inner truth with outer appearance. And she says, do you know me? Do you know who you're speaking with? Philosoph, the philosoph answers, as if I could not know you. And she continues, you now no, no doubt know me as a phenomenon that is insofar as I exist for you or in my external manifestation. You cannot know me as I am in myself, that is my thoughts and intimate feelings as they are in me and for me. You know them only when they manifest themselves outwardly in the expression of my eyes, in my words, in my gestures. These are external phenomena and yet, here the philosoph interrupts, and yet he says, when I look into the deep azure of your eyes, when I hear the music of your voice, is it outward phenomena of sight and sound that I perceive? My God, I know your thoughts and feelings and by your thoughts and feelings, I know your inner being. And here, Sophie channeling Socrates, I think says, and this is the way sums up and this is the way that all beings know each other. So although Solovyov previously used poetic diction to convey wisdom, again, Saritsamaya, and here couches this discussion of epistemology in Kantian terms, right? Phenomenon, intelligible character, being, or thing in itself. He could just as e have easily used theological terminology at this point to make reference to Gregory Palamas, the theologian of hesychasm. And I'm gonna to have to leave this little bit section out, but if you're wanting me to talk about it later, um, if there is time, um, I will. Um, and I wanted to do a little side talk on the transfiguration, on the Feast of the Transfiguration, but that's just gonna have to wait. So 
knowing the essence through the energies does not mean, in hesychasm or in solidio, does not mean confusing the material or sensual with the metaphysical or spiritual. So just as Christian believers say that one can know uh, Christ as human and God, um, simultaneously we can so know divine and earthly wisdom to use Silvio's favorite theological trope, undivided yet un unmerged. The divine wisdom that Solovyov revisions in the Sophia, La Sophia, takes both, uh, partakes both of the physical world explored by the materialists in the latter part of the 19th century when the philosopher lived, and partakes of the spirit world also sought sometimes by the very same researchers. And as in the poetry, she speaks in and of the language of her precursors in biblical verse, in Jewish and Christian mysticism and in philosophy. We can see her as the bridge and the bridge builder or the priest to use Solovyov, Solovyov puns, the pontifex, who unites the opposing tendencies of the day as well as the distant past with the present and promised future. So Solovyov speaks even more intimately to Solovyov in the La Sophia manuscript in a different discourse that I've already pointed out to you, automatic writing. Um, and um, I also have a little bit that I can say about actually the process of automatic writing. Um, but um, I'm gonna just let you look at this um, and see how it worked with Solovyov, how Sophia speaks through her, through his pen, right? And in the, either blank pages or the margins of uh, his manuscripts, not only La Sophia, but even later ones. And we need to recognize that unlike the fellow spiritualists in the 1870s and 80s and 90s and on, Solovyov did not use this practice of um, automatic writing to connect loved ones who had passed over into the spirit world. And that's how it usually is used. As seances became ever more popular, they sometimes turned into, as you know, parlor games in which participants thought, sought concrete evidence of life after death. And people were in there with the new technology of cameras and recording technology to get this concrete evidence. But Solovyov's adressant had never lived a life before death, nor had she died a death at the end of life. She has no limits either before or after, but is an eternal all. She was not a lover of his or a mother or a friend, but rather a belief or an idea or an intuition or a vision that have been developed for centuries in a variety of mystical and spiritual systems. We might be somewhat taken aback by the rather mundane nature of Sophie's written communications with her earthly correspondent with a signature that alludes to the personal name for Sophia in the dialogues, but writing sometimes in Cyrillic, the script of Solovyov's mother tongue. Wisdom in these examples expresses concern about his health, his eating habits, and his feelings. And most surprising, she herself seems capable of physical feelings, lamenting a headache at one point. For Solovyov, the very earthiness of the written chatter must have seemed perfect both material and spiritual, both concrete and somehow ethereal. In speaking directly to him, divine wisdom shows herself to be the mediating force uniting opposites. As in the poetry, Sophia in Solovyov's examples of automatic writing and in the dialogue, um, she's both the medium and the message, both the articulator and the articulated. More prose, I'm gonna speak about it for five seconds. In his lectures on divine humanity or Bhagachalagachistva, lectures on divine, on, on God manhood, we translate in many ways. Um, I'm apologize, I'm gonna to have to leave you on your own to explore this as well as others of his Sophia texts, wisdom texts. Here in this work, uh, Zolovyov asserts that human nature participates in divinity, striving ever to interact with God. Yet he claims that we should look first for the divine, not above, but within. In the middle section here, before one can know the unconditional content as a reality outside of himself, one must recognize it as an idea within himself. And the truth, a little aside for him, the visionary is always male. 
seeing, in this case, a female vision. Um, so we are forever, so we forever participate with both the created world and with God, so that this real mutual interaction of God and man is what Solovyov calls the divinely human process, the Bogachilovichesky process. Therefore, Sophia, who appears to inspire Solovyov from without, also arises from within the poet and poetic or the writer. Uh, and, and creation is thus a prime example of the Bogachilovichesky process, the divine human process itself. What is more, Sophia is not only the inspiration, but also the subject, as we saw in the works we've examined so far. She is the vehicle for that creativity in written form and the goal of that creativity or transfiguration all at once. The humorous short story at the dawn of Mr. Youth from 1892 reprieves the light of dawn in its title, obviously, as well as the light surrounding a beautiful female figure and then shining from within the hero. This semi-autobiographical again humorous account describes how the protagonist faints and is caught between train cars by a woman, Julie. And it's interesting to note that we know from Solomon's diary that Yulinka, or little Julie, was the name of the girl he had a crush on when he was nine. So despite the fact that Solovyov here pokes fun at, his at the skeptical ardor of his young self, he says, with the serious air of a mentor as befitted a 19 year old philosopher, right? And also pokes fun at his companion, Julie, who was an obviously, he writes, shallow woman with whom he had just, quote, surrendered to the earthly principle. Nonetheless, the writer describes a vision of what elsewhere Solovyov termed divine wisdom. And I'll read this. Regaining consciousness, I saw only the bright sunlight, a strip of blue sky, and bending over me in that light and against the sky, the image of a beautiful woman. She looked at me with wondrous and familiar eyes and whispered something quiet and tender. Without a question, this was Julie. Those were her eyes, but how the rest had changed. What a rosy light burned in her face. How tall and majestic she was. Something wondrous took place within me. It was as though my entire existence, all my thoughts, feelings, and desires had melted and flowed together. Oops, give me that. Flowed together into a single, endless, sweet, bright, and dispassionate sensation. A single wondrous image was motionlessly, re motionlessly reflected in that sensation as in a pure mirror. And I felt anew that in that one was all. So the rosy light radiating from Julie or Sophia's face the wonder, the sweet sensation, the eyes, the reflected image, the tender whisper are all familiar from the earlier poems, as is, of course, the beautiful and royal female form. Next, Solovyov's influence on the 20th century. And I am coming to the very end here, so you see how that this is a very short section. So Solovyov's various wisdom writings stimulated an entire generation of symbolist poets, painters. Actually, here you see a, a, a wonderful painting called Sophia Wisdom by the painter Ruhr. Um, and I wanna thank here my friend Marilyn Smith for bringing this picture to my, to my knowledge uh, because it's just perfect. Um, so this entire generation of uh, creative writers and painters, as well as religious philosophers and theologians um, were stimulated by his wisdom writings and they took their, their own revisions of divine wisdom into emigration after the revolution where they thrived for several decades. According to the major symbolist theoretician and poet, Vyacheslav Ivanov, Solovyov was, and I'm quoting here, the true educator of our religious aspirations a lyricist of Orpheus, the bearer of the principle of creative order, yet 10 years after his death, we are engaged in neither the continuation nor the perfection of his task, but again, only in its search. So Ivanov's fellow symbolists, Andre Bieli and Alexander Bloch, as well as Solovyov's own nephew, Sergei Solovyov, for whom I have no photo, and it's only because as I looked on the internet for one, the internet was blown up with uh, um, items about Sergei Solo Solovyov, the uh, film director who just died at the end of the last year. So I didn't get one of, of this Sergei. 
Solovyov, they all turn to Sofia for inspiration in their poetry. And in fact, in the name of Sofia, they created a short-lived love triangle between Bloch Bieli and Bloch's wife, Lyubov Mandeleva, whose first name Lyubov actually means love. Bloch's first book, book of poetry, Verses on a Beautiful Lady, obviously draws on the figure of a beautiful Sophia. And likewise, Bieli's first collection, Golden Azure, takes its title from the colors we've seen most uh, frequently associated by Silvio with his visions. Onto the Sophiology of Florensky and Bulgakov, about which I suspect many of you here have been more likely to have read instead of Silvio. Um, as I've tried to show, Solovyov's Sophia is both personal and universal. Florensky's is more formally so, and I would point you to your own reading of his uh, fascinating, in fact, long symbolist treatise, The Pillar and Ground of Truth, an essay in Orthodox Theod Theodicy in 12 letters, and it is in the 10th letter that is called Sophia, that he expresses a Sophia image um, vision. Um, most clearly. Father Sergei Bulgakov actually himself did more to bring sophiology to the West than anywhere else, uh, to, where he had been forced to emigrate after the revolution and where he founded the St. Sergius Orthodox Theological Institute in Paris. Bulgakov, like Solovyov, began as a Marxist and published on political economy, then moved to idealism before returning to the faith of his fathers and being ordained as a priest in 1918. He published his early, The Philosophy Economy in 1912, it's 12 years after Solovyov's death, um, and already shows a very strong debt to Solovyov and contains an, a lengthy discussion of Sophia. But it's in his second dogmatic trilogy, the, La the Lamb of God, the Comforter, and the Bride of the Lamb that he most fully expresses his Sophiology. And it's for this that he was condemned by the Orthodox establishment and immigration. And for a discussion of this scandal, but even more for an excellent analysis of Bulgakov's works, I want to point you to, to Paul Valier's Modern Russian Theology, Orthodox Theology in a New Key. Sophia for Bulgakov, in fact, was always part of his philosophy of economy, which is what he called material reality. Sophiology was, in fact, an attempt by contemporary Russian theology, and in fact, contemporary Russian theology really only began, or modern Russian theology only began in the 19th century, just before Solovyov. It was an attempt to deal with the real world, to accept material reality, and to move out of the static Byzantine medieval Russian past. Uh, what Professor Volier shows is that the scandal that led to calls for Bulgakov's combination, uh, condemnation perhaps had less to do with Sophia and her alleged encroachment on the integrity of the Trinity, although it did have to do with that, but more or equally as much, uh, it had to do with an historical, political, and with social forces that were battering the fate of the Russian, uh, Russian church outside Russia and a fight for, its dis for survival in part against the patriarchate of Moscow, which remained in and under the influence of the Soviet Union. In the fight, neo-patristics won, and Sophia went underground. So did she stay there? Some contemporary Western scholars have occasionally rediscovered Bulgakov and others, and Solovyov herself emerges briefly, often in theological and feminist discussion outside of the world of orthodoxy, very little within. Um, and I suspect that that is a phenomenon that's reflected in the interest of, of a number of you here today. She can be seen in the attraction of both Protestant laypersons and clergy in the mystical aspect of orthodoxy, which also obviously had drawn Solovyov. This is not my area. I can try to point you um, in other directions for it if you like. Something I know a modicum more about, as I read the whole damn book. Um, we can find her somewhat contorted in the odd prose work of poet, writer, and Christian mystic uh, Daniel Andreev called The Rose of the World. Um, and again, perhaps in the short-lived cult of the great brother, the great white brotherhood of Maria Devi Christos, that uh, peaked in 1993 after the fall of the Soviet Union. When according to one scholar, people emerged, a quote, with the most indefinite eclectic worldview 
with a heightened interest in Eastern religious teachings and spiritualism in modern parascientific and parareligious mythology, built around parapsychology, UFOs, et cetera. And I myself ran into this uh, at a, what I thought was a serious, going to be a serious uh, convention on um, the writer um, Nikolai Fyodorov, but in fact turned out to be much more about UFOs. Um, a friend, colleague, former student of mine, Elliot Bornstein, wrote about this spiritual atmosphere in the 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union, the following. Today's God-seeking Russian faces a veritable spiritual smorgasbord whose likes had not been seen since the Silver Age, 1880 to 1917. That is exactly the years of influence of Solovyov. Spiritual seekers in contemporary Russia are equally syncretic, not to say omnivorous, in their approach. The program of the most noteworthy post-Soviet cult, the Great White Brotherhood, was a new age goulash of chakras, karma, Kabbalah, and even music theory. So where are we left? In the 20th century, and certainly in the tragic current events of today, the focus of intellectuals, believers, and wackos alike is elsewhere. So, this is some shameless advertisement. So will the Russian divine Sophia reemerge in the future in her or his or its more substantial form or perhaps even wiser? Some of that depends on scholars and theologians who are willing to go back to Solovyov with an analytic eye to take his revisions of Sophia seriously and to continue the search as Vyacheslav Ivanov encouraged us to do. Thank you very much. And I look forward to talking with you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and leave it to Adi now. Judith, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, very rich, fascinating material. Uh, I see the questions are coming in. Um, how many questions? I how can many answer? questions? As many as you want. How many ones I can answer. <laughs> but I have to, I'll have a little of this so that that'll help. Me. Oh, yes, good. <laughs> Uh, while you do that, this gonna... evening here where I am. Yes, yes. I, I, I wish I could have that as well. I should have more prepared. Um, okay. Well, here's here's something that struck me. Uh, you said at the beginning that uh, Sophia is not a person, but an energy. And yet, in so many of Solovyov's uh, works, the poems you read, his visions, the unpublished manuscript. She is clearly identified as a person, and not just as a generic person, but with golden hair and azure eyes. Um, now, I, I see in, in Jakob Böhme, whom we uh, read a little bit in the in this reading group before getting to Solovyov, there's a reserve uh, about uh, identifying Sophia as a person, probably because of some worry he had about the Trinity. And uh, so, how important is it that Sophia is a is a face, uh, a, a voice, and and could you say a little bit more about why do you think she's not a person, despite all the evidence to the contrary in 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 uh, Solovyov? Um, I think one of the pieces of evidence um, is the number of different ways that he tried to articulate this uh, experience that he had of Sophia. Um, and yes, in the poetry, for sure, there is a very um, clear um, personification. Um, but he also spoke of her in many, many other ways. He's, as I tried to say at one point, he not only uses poetic diction, but he uses um, both Kantian and Hegelian uh, terminology. Um, he's constantly wandering around and, and much more so that is milling around, right? As one would in the church. Um, the idea as trying to find numerous ways in numerous genres um, to express what this intuition he has. So only one of the ways is in this personification. Okay. Um, so I do think that he did feel her as he felt he was talking to her, but he also um, believed strongly that this was more than than a her. It was an energy that would allowed him to feel both the, the world connected both within him and outside of him. 
and both material and divine. So he need, there was very little way to talk about the divine. There were much more ways to talk about the material aspects. Yes. And by energy, uh, what, what was helpful is when you mentioned the hesychastic distinction between essence and energies in Palama. So you mean energy in that latter sense specifically, perhaps, uh, uh, I mean or, or that, possibly? I mean it in that specific sense and more. Um, and one of the um, ways in which um, I would teach about uh, Eastern Christianity and Russian Orthodoxy to students who, in American students who were clearly, almost all of them much more aware of um, their, uh, their, if they were Christians, much more aware of either their Catholic childhood or their Protestant childhood, most of my students although I wasn't legally supposed to ask what faith tradition they came from, would say I'm a lapsed Catholic or uh, yeah, my parents went to a you know, Baptist church or, or whatever. So we would talk about the difference between, for instance, the Nicene Creed um, where, and um, my, that adds an, a, a and from in it to make it look like God the Father, God the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, were in a sort of direct um, um, ver vertical um, declension. And the um, figure of a triangle is much more appropriate instead of a line to talk about the um, orthodox understanding of the three members of the Trinity. And what Sophia turns out to be, in, in my reading, um, and I think in Solovyov's intuition, um, the energy between the, the energy that's on the le the legs of that triangle, not the three points, but that which connects all three of them, in fact, to each other. Um, and then, we, if you if you go now to read the lectures on on Bogachilovich's so the lectures on divine humanity, you can see how he then takes that model and brings it down into various um, realms, down to human behavior. Um, so that all of us are in, engaged somehow in this connecting the three points of a stable triangle rather than what one might mm -hmm. see as a less stable um, vertical force. So it's that energy that I refer to, if that okay. makes sense. That does make sense. And it, it does remind me of, uh, I, I have it here, the... Uh, um, Jakob Böhm is on the election of faith in his own description of Sophia. Uh, she, she does seem as in some passages described as also the, she's active through all three persons and in their relation among each other. And uh, so she's, mm -hmm. she, she's both first and, and fourth and uh, she comes out in, in, in various ways. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more question, which I must ask because several people have asked me to, to put it uh, here and I see it's come up again uh, and then we and perhaps want something else, but still within that uh, Trinitarian cosmological frame, what is the relation to this energy specifically to uh, Christ? I mean, there's one, one could say that Sophia and uh, in some icons you've shown, she's associated with this, uh, the star of transfiguration. So there's uh, conflated perhaps with the function of the Holy Spirit, the third person, and in some places with the second person. Right, but, not really ever with the first person, it's true, but uh, yes. That's right. That's right. So could, could, you, could you address that? I guess that's no. always a question. But no, no, that's an impossible <laughs> question. No, there is no answer because, yes, it, you're right, uh, that she is associated with Christ very clearly and that, in fact, she's, you know, he's not the only one to do that. The, you know, the author of, of 1 Corinthians does exactly the same thing, um, associated wisdom with Christ, yes. uh, also associated with the transfiguration, with the Holy Spirit. Um, luckily, I'm not in a position to have to declare Solovyov a heretic or not a heretic, um, and there there is no easy answer to that. Okay. Unless someone someone actually of our listeners has an answer, I would be very happy to hear. I, it. I, I, I perhaps some people have intonations, but uh, yes, this seems <laughs> about it's a difficult question to answer. Good. Um, all right, I, I have several more questions, but I'm, I'm gonna, I need to start fielding in questions from uh, the audience in the limited time that we have. Um, so I don't know if you can see some of them on your screen. Um, uh, let me see, I can turn on questions. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, so uh, here's, 
here's a question. Uh, the theosophical, uh, there, there's an, I think it disappeared here. Right, there was a question about, um, uh, by Charles Ibdis, uh, that some of you have rejected the spiritualist emphasis on automatic writing, uh, uh, or does he reject that, uh, that automatic writing in the same way that Blavatsky did? And I would add to that question, could you say a little bit more about the relation between uh, Solovyov and the Theosophical Society Blavatsky and that milieu? Because there seems to be many parallels and uh, there's a lot of interest uh, in the initiative here in, in, in the Theosophical Societies. So if you could address that. Yeah. Um, Solovyov very specifically condemned the writings of Blavatsky um, saying that what the, the Theosophists were doing was um, blending everything all together, whereas his emphasis was always to be um, undivided yet unmerged, right? Um, that as traditions are compared, um, his emphasis would be to um, emphasize, his, he would emphasize that their integrity remained separate. Um, so just as the ways that the, the three three members of the Trinity can be both separate and one, you know, yes. multiple and one at the same time. And so he he very specifically condemned them. Um, um, as you know, there was a woman who presented herself as the um, incarnation of um, Sophia and offered herself to um, yes, she, she took the, uh, the incarnation yeah. of the, the second figure of the, the second member of the Trinity. Um, he was kind to her, but certainly did not accept her. So did he reject this more uh, new, well, I guess old age, new age, <laughs> a blending of all kinds of spiritualism um, or spiritism together? He did reject it, which doesn't mean that he wasn't interested. And he did go to lots of seances yes. and he probably did want to believe. Um, so again, those two contradictory things can sit side by side mutually in peace in him. Yes, I, uh, there was this passage in the, um, in the dialogue La Sophie, which really uh, uh, stood out for us and we discussed it in the, in the reading group where Solovyov, discusses the true universal religion, which is, is preaching. He calls it, it is both the final product of Christianity, Christianity in its perfection. Also, it is the positive synthesis of all religions. And even <laughs> further, the synthesis of religion, philosophy, science of the internal spiritual sphere with the external sphere with political life and social life. It, inclu it includes everything in itself. Mm -hmm. This is, I was quoting Solovyov's passage here. So mm -hmm. obviously the question set up like, oh, this seems similar to what Blavatsky is doing, but I, that Solovyov has a di very different taste than philosophy for me. I, I, very different. And very also different I, 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 I do a, a disservice to Solovyov by spending so much time on that, on the La Sofia manuscript, mm -hmm. um, because it really was unfinished and it yes. really is, um, you know, a mixture of notes to himself at all yes. times and contradictory and, you know, what we would say goes off the deep end at a, at a number of places and a number of places just sort of gets mixed up in his own terminology. Yes. Um, so it's not as fair of us to take a single quote out of that. Um, yes if we might out of one of his more polished and... Um, That's right, that, that text has to be read very carefully uh, in context and uh, not as definitive statements uh, made by Solovyov. Although I could see parallels that uh, in those statements with what Schelling was saying and the notion of the mm -hmm. philosophical religion and, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and some of other of Solovyov's works. Um, this connects this question with a question that uh, Sean McGraw our previous speaker, who spoke on Schelling and, and Burma, has just put for us here. As to how, thanks Judith Brilliant, how are we to distinguish rigorous sophiology from wacko, your word, uh, sophiology? <laughs> uh, because toward the end of your talk, uh, is this really the, uh, the, you know, are these really the spiritual heirs of sophiology, this Maria uh, and, and how do we distinguish between the two? Okay. Um, 
no. I mean, I hoped in my tone, I, I was able to show that those are not the serious errors. Um, but I think there will be times when we can't distinguish the two. And um, the other thing to remember also with Sophia, with uh, Solovyov himself, could be a different letter that begins those two names. Um, he did um, grow throughout his life. And the, those first intuitions, including uh, La Sofia, were when he was still a fairly young man. He didn't live till, till a ripe old age, but he, he lived another good uh, 25 years after that. Um, and he might have rejected more of his earlier stuff. Um, he never did end up publishing the, the, the Sophia dialogues. He did not at all reject his poetry, um, but he was more comfortable than maybe we are with the, um, the, the coexistence of the unknowable and the more serious, I forget what it is that, what, what in the question, what the term was, the more rigorous sociology. More rigorous sociology. Music, rigorous sociology. Solovyov himself was willing to experiment with everything, whatever brought up for him the sense of wholeness being connect, the all being connected and yet maintaining the integrity of each individual part of multiplicity. So um, we maybe can never really know if anything is the true heir of Solovyov. The true heir of Solovyov, right. right. I, I guess that depends on also personal preferences, but uh, but I you know one does get this. I mean, Solovyov was is often described as a, the first systematic. He's a systematic thinker, as well as mm -hmm. as a mystic, a joke, and a prankster, and all of that. Mm -hmm. But um, I think part of what he's doing, and you know, this idea of uh, uniting the opposite science uh, and philosophy, that has to do with the rigorous side of it. And if that is absent, yes. then uh, it's not perhaps fully in line with his his, his project. And actually, I think I can tell a little personal um, anecdote here that I had thought when I was thinking about what to write my dissertation on a couple years ago, um, that I would write about Solovyov. Um, but as I read more and more of his works, because I did not write my dissertation on Solovyov, I wrote on the Cossacks, a very different topic. Um, I began to realize that I could not possibly write on him because his knowledge was so much greater than mine was. And he would mention a philosopher that I hadn't even heard the name of at that point, or he would, he would mention a spiritual tradition that I had no idea existed. And so he himself, this might be a way to, to recognize rigor. He himself um, had the background, had the scholarly background um, to, to speak authoritar authoritatively in a way that Blavatsky, let's say, did not. Um, or, you know, Maria Devi Christos did not. Um, and so I think that that's one way that we can, um, we, we often say that uh, it's important to know that Picasso started out writing uh, a drawing, excuse me, there's the writing of icons, drawing uh, very realistic paintings. Um, and from that very strong basis in the history of art and, um, artistic technique, from there, he moved on to his, um, his more abstract um, and impressionistic kinds of works. And I think that you can, if you can feel that background in an articulator of Sophia, you will be mm -hmm. finding rigor. Okay, that's a very good question and uh, answer. And uh, maybe it partly answers another question here by uh, Henry Jameson. Um, did Solovyov have, have a thoroughgoing cosmology that could be, uh, and could he account for his encounters with Sophia in a way that could be applied as a method? So basically the application of Sophia as a method, what you've just said uh, points toward that. There's this, uh, there's a kind of a, uh, a, a philological scholarly rigor to, 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 to Solovyov, to what he's doing. Uh, could you say a little bit more about the application uh, of, of, of Solovyov? Of Solovyov, if, if he, how did he intend his message to be practiced, lived, uh, applied? His philosophy. That's a very yeah. difficult question. Yeah, um, he does often fall back on 
different cosmologies um, and you can feel the, the, you know, the neo neoplatonic cosmology and a Gnostic um, cosmology and a Kabbalistic cosmology. He never really articulated his own in any totally clear way. Um, I think his whole, and maybe this is just my tuition, that his whole uh, goal in life was to try, continually try uh, to articulate that which can't be articulated. So any particular cosmology is only going to be one articulation of what reality of the universe is. Um, and that's why I think it's important uh, to do what, what some of his heirs did not, and that is read all of his work. Because it's easy in Solovyov to say, oh, he was a, a political philosopher. Oh, he was yes. a, a social um, gadfly. Oh, he was a wacko. Or, oh, he was a, an Egalian. Um, or he was a Kantian. He was all those things. Because he was constantly trying to articulate his, his feeling of reality in different terms. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, um, Judith, I, I would like to convey this question by my colleague, co-host of the series, Mimi Winnick. Uh, thank you for a wonderful and vivid talk. Could you expand on whether the 19th century, uh, 19th century feminism or discussions of the woman question influenced Solovyov's sophiology and did it influence 20th century feminisms? This is a, again, a question that has come up again in our dis private discussions here. I think definitely both of those things. Um, the, the sort of women's movement began in, in Imperial Russia long before it began in, um, in Western Europe and certainly in the United States. Um, and um, like many of you there here in our virtual, virtual reality um, might have read the, the uh, work by Chernyshevsky, uh, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, Chernyshevsky called what is to be done that's very centered yes. on the you know sort of uh, the liberation of um, um, women what happened in the eight, um, 1880s um, 1890s um, is that feminists in Russia became very closely associated with uh, revolutionaries um, and the term Prostitutka, prostitute became associated with that sort of, you have a little trinity there of, of feminist, revolutionary and, uh, and prostitute um, in the public imagination. And so that was always also behind the then development of feminism um, in late imperial um, Russia. And we see it also in uh, Bloch and Bieli and the symbolists um, focus on the, the beautiful woman um, because they also found, let's see if I still have it in this, if I can um, read what I crossed out here. Um, maybe yes, maybe no. So the simplest revision um, of Solovyov's revisions proved more abstract then Solovyov's multivalent expressions of Sophia and soon fell into a binary that he eschewed. She became debased in images such as Bloch's famous stranger, Ms. Nakonka, that some of you yes. might know. And, but I write that Bloch's beautiful woman in this poem, Ms. Nakonka, turns out to be a prostitute. That fact suggests the symbolist disillusionment in their ability to create a bridge between the binaries of mundane reality and spiritual world of beauty, but it does not disprove Sophia's does does not disprove Sophia's own ability to do so. So I think what happened through the um, in Russia through this the, this initial very strong push for women's rights um, is that um, sort of ambivalence and disillusionment with both the end of the czarist regime and the um, beginning of the Soviet regime um, tainted <laughs> the, the um, tainted sort of the legacy of that and um, debased it. And it became a black and white 
or this or that, and that's not how Solovyov had seen it. But I do think that Solovyov was very aware of that movement in, in Russia in the 18, in 1870s um, and on, and that it also, uh, that movement also picked up on Solovyov's thought. Yes. So, hope that helps. Uh, uh, Gibbons has this, uh, a book on the, the social context of Jakob Böhme and Böhmenism as well, and he mm -hmm. does suggest that it has to, the development of sophiology has to do with the social transformation of women in 16th, 17th century England. Mm -hmm. So perhaps something similar is happening in yeah. Yeah. Uh, in Russia. Yeah. Although in in the in the dialogue in the Missy Youth, uh, I don't know whether he's describing his earlier views or it's very always not very clear in Slavia about. Uh, or it is clear, but it's uh, one has to read the whole thing to get what the, the flavor of what Solovyov is saying. He 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 uh, he expresses very negative views toward the emancipation of you know in that early passages. Yes. Um, I don't yeah, know to what extent that there's a lot of contradictions. Um, and um, yeah, and and uh, I think some of uh, his legacy or or this kind of. The, the irony he's playing on both registered was lost among some of his followers who sought really to take it right. and emphasize one direction over the other. Right. And often the, the ultra serious direction, whereas for Solovyov, the laughter was a, a very large part of it. So and could you say you something about. briefly about that, the laughter and, uh, and also the silence? Because there's a question about the silence. Uh, he's, uh, the role of silence in the three meetings and at the library, he speaks of the sacred silence. And I will, after this question, I will finish with the last one. So uh, okay. Judith, thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, so um, serves me right for not rereading my article on uh, laughter in Solovyov. Um, well, we need to read that, okay. <laughs> but very, um, very much so he describes laughter in a Sophianic, sense um and he erroneously uh says uh, quotes um the greeks is saying that humans are the only animals that laugh it's shown that that's not actually the case yes. but he wanted to show that laughter itself is a divinely human process process and it's associated with it's related to creation. And he himself was known to have this really actually pretty obnoxiously loud guffaw and a number of his, um, his contemporaries uh, noted that and he was always looking for something funny. Um, and so I think again, this was a, 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 a falling into binaries where, where some of his heirs saw only the serious side of him and missed that in fact, it was the humorous side of him that captures Sophia even, even more, yes. the sense of combining that which is unspeakable, ineffable, right? You, you know, often a, a joke is something that can't really be uh, expressed yeah. in other words, but also can be very, very serious. And I think that's how he saw laughter. And, and the silence would be the ineffable part, I guess, which- yes, because that's that's silence, but also I think that that's a more typical mystical um, yes. um, image of, that which is true and that which is truly real. Um, so that when he has this vision, everything else is silenced and it's just that, that vision. So all of the chatter around him um, goes away and he just hears the bells and the ringing of her, of her voice. I think that's a, that's a pretty typical um, mystical image. Yeah, I took the, I mean, when he speaks about laughter, he speaks about it in that passage and that uh, the dialogue with Sophie, as a kind of stoic disdain for material. But I think there's, this, this is only one part of what he means by right. laughter, right. another part, yeah. Because his another... laughter was a real, real hearty belly laughter, right? Very material. Exactly, very material indeed. So, um, okay, thank you. And maybe I'll, add, I'll end with one last question. Uh, you did uh, say that uh, Paul Valier was among our, our uh, audience and I'm uh, very I happy so. to I hear that. I did see him, so I see. I think I, uh, you should invite him for a talk at some point. That would be lovely. So I want to salute him because his work was is very important for me as well, and I'm very happy uh, he's here today. And um, uh, he, in in a in a kind of classic description uh, passage describing what the Russian school was attempting to do, the Russian school of uh, Orthodox theology. Uh, I'm going to read it here and ask you to comment on it. Uh, 
uh, he says that they, you know the Russian school grappled with the challenges facing all faith communities in modern times, such as the tension between tradition and freedom, the challenge of modern humanism, the mission of the church to modern society, the status of dogma and modern intellectuality and the significance of religious pluralism. This engagement reflected an interest in philosophy, not just as a specialized academic pursuit, but in the most basic sense of the word, the quest for Sophia, for wisdom, for insight into the meaning of life. I, I, I love this <laughs> description about the, the Russian uh, school as a whole was about and attempting to do. Mm -hmm. So where does this leave us today? I mean, the, you know, what they were trying to do, their challenges are also our challenges today. Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. Or mm -hmm. if anything, these uh, polarities have been accentuated. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so how, how, yeah, what's the message today from Solovyo that we can take? Where? Um, I think the message is that we can't ignore the contradictions. We should actually enjoy the contradictions. Um, and we certainly cannot ignore the very real and sometimes painful realities that surround us. Um, because those are also connected as one with a, a larger world, something beyond us. Although it looks like maybe one man is bombing certain places. In fact, it's all connected. Um, it's all, it's all un, un, um, undivided, but un, un, not un, merged. <laughs> I'll get that for a second. Um, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with Paul more. Um, uh, that it is the, the story of our day as well. Um, yeah. And I think we do, in our many ways, history yes. goes, I mean, you know, in, in, in very, whether it's cycles or waves or whatever image you wanna, you wanna have, um, we often come back to, to a, a kind of culture that we, we humans have lived through before. Yes, and uh, perhaps our very interest in this uh, Sophia and sociology today is an evidence of this cyclical nature of these questions as they as, as they yeah, come up. I think so. I think so. Okay, I, I think we're uh, we're out of time. Uh, Judith, thank you so much for uh, for coming on to speak it's to us. A lot of fun. Um, as I will send you the questions which we haven't been able to address, and uh, if anyone has other questions, please uh, write them in here or send them to me, and I will forward them to Judith after the talk. Uh, so I tell you good evening and, uh, and good day to you. And thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay, thank All you right. so much. Bye. Bye. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.